Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lost Archives, a Star Wars Legends lore series. So, today we're going to be discussing lightsaber resistant materials. Everything from the dreaded electro staffs of General Grievous' bodyguards to the Iron of Mandalorian armor. I'll be mentioning other creatures as well, uh, ones that have been used either by other people or even force users in the Star Wars universe, as well as explaining a bit of the strengths and weaknesses about each type of material. But first, we'll start off with one of the more commonly known ones, Cortosis. Mostly mined in an ore, Cortosis comes in various different strands, weaves or ores. Now, the standard Cortosis weave is used in various blades, such as Vibro Swords or Vibro Blades, to give people using just regular swords an edge against lightsaber wielding opponents. This was mostly common in the Old Republic era, draw in the Knights of the Old Republic game, where you had Vibro Blades and Vibro Swords that could resist lightsaber strikes. By the point of the Galactic Civil War and the New Jedi Order eras, this has mostly fallen out of common practice. Now, it was a weave that was inside these weapons, which meant that it could only parry and deflect lightsabers, it couldn't do what other types of cortosis would do. For example of this, a full, fully pure cortosis blade would disrupt the lightsaber and make it useless for several minutes. Uh, one such example of this is when Darth Vader tracked down a bunch of Jedi, started massacring them as Vader does. One Jedi pulls out a cortosis blade, whacks Vader's lightsaber with it, and then goes, right, your blade's now useless for several minutes, plenty of time to kill you. And then Vader does what Vader does best, broke the Jedi's net using the Force, and then stole his blade and used it to kill his mates. Stupid move, really. But, he tried. But the main point of this is cortosis in its pure form disrupts lightsabers. Now the way it does this is it feeds the power of the blade back onto itself which causes it to short out. Now there are several cases of it being used in armour. Uh, there is the Shadow Trooper armour from the Star Wars Jedi Outcast game which was used to in conjunction with other materials to make a lightsaber resistant armour. As this wasn't pure cortosis it did mean that it would just reflect the energy instead of making it fall back on the on the weapons energy chamber causing it to short. And the problem with that as well is it meant that repeated strokes with a lightsaber would eventually destroy the armor. If you're following my Let's Play series, eventually you'll see me do this. So the next uh, lightsaber resistant material is Frick. Uh, you may have heard me butcher this in the Imperial Knights video as I wasn't sure on the pronunciation at the time. So Frick was a lightweight alloy as well as being very, very heat resistant as well as being able to resist electricity. So this gave it quite good, decent properties for deflecting lightsaber strikes as well as even blaster bolts. It meant it had quite good use in battle armor. The trouble it being is it's quite a rare substance, even more rarer than cortosis. This meant that it did actually see limited use in warfare because it could cost you a fortune to produce it for weapons, especially ones that could get destroyed with repeated strikes from a lightsaber. Couple examples of this would be used in the Dark Trooper project. It was used to armor them and make them resistant to blaster fire as well as lightsabers, mostly due to its high malleability and combined with other elements. It was also used as the coverings for Palpatine's lightsaber, which actually reduces one of the biggest weaknesses to constructing your lightsaber out of materials, is that you could cut it off and then render the blade useless. Another example would as well be the bodyguards of General Grievous using in their electro stuffs, meaning that you could not only use the electros at each end, you could then whack somebody with the middle of the staff and still not get it cut through. Now a testament to the durability of of Frick is that there was a canister of it on Elderon when it was blown up by the Death Star that was still intact after the Death Star had blown up Alderaan. So that's some incredible levels of durability. Just to point out as well, inside the actual container as well was a holocron made by Senator Bail Organa, which contained a list of possible replacement planets to Yavin 4. This was so that if the base was compromised they could flee somewhere else. On another side note, the Empire nationalised every single mining, op frick, mining operation that they ever found about as they became aware of them. Granted, this did mean that anyone that had discovered they had a small scale of it, they would try and keep it under wraps. But if the Empire found out about it, 
<laughs> There'd be stormtroopers knocking down your doors yesterday. Next on our list of lightsaber resistant materials would be Ultrachrome. This was a metal that was highly conductive and was impervious to both blaster and slug thrower weapon type weaponry. It was severely resistant to lightsaber attacks and was also immune to certain metal eating fungi that some other lightsaber resistant metals were not. Uh, this was mostly used in starship armour at the time of the Great Sift War and other events around that time. Uh, most notably however is that when a lightsaber strikes it repeatedly because it will conduct the energy across the entire mass eventually repeated strokes will cause the metal to melt. At that point you might as well have just let them hit you with the saber. Uh, on a notable exception Imperial Inquisitors during the Galactic Civil War would use this metal to protect themselves. I have no idea how they were able to find said metal at the time given its near near legendary rarity although Palpatine is known for commenting it that he based it on a previous design that he'd found somewhere else. Though knowing Palpatine especially in the Legends canon he probably stole this from somebody else and then viciously murdered them. <laughs> oh Palpy you stole everything that wasn't nailed down come back like with a crowbar and three nails. So next we move on to one of my personal favourites in this material is Mandalorian Iron, also known as Beskar, which was a durable iron ore which could be made into various types of equipment from armour, blasters to starships and is what gave the Mandalorians their reputation as Jedi killers, combining the durability of the armour with their combat skills. Now, the secret to making this metal was guarded quite religiously by the Mandalorians and never given to anyone outside of the planet. Now, the Empire is known to have heavily mined the planet for every ounce of the metal they could find, but they never discovered the secret of smelting it into its configurations that the Mandos did. This actually did have a serious effect on Mandalore's economy after the Galactic Civil War as they didn't have a new source of the Mandalorian iron, instead relying on um, Jura steel and other stuff to make armour, which they were never really quite happy about because Jura steel is cardboard compared to Mandalorian iron. Though during the time of the Yuuzhan Vong War, the Mandalorian planet did actually get struck by a meteorite by the Yuuzhan Vong to which a Mandalorian metallurgist did respond with eh, sometimes the Vong do you a favour as it unveiled a cache of a quite rich vein of Mandalorian iron to which the Mandalorians do what they did best with it mined the crap out of it and used it to build new Basilisk Starfighters named after their old Basilisk war droids not to mention they replaced Boba Fett's armour of Durasteel with proper Mandalorian iron even gave him a collar piece to stop his head getting cut off by Jedi. Something his father didn't have in Attack of the Clones. To a noticeable exception, uh, Freed and Nad, one of the ancient Sith Lords, had his tomb encased in the stuff. Something to which Exar Kun is known for commenting, By the Force, I thought a lightsaber could cut through anything. Their walls are barely scratched. Next on our list of lightsaber resistant materials would be force imbued blades. Now this is a weapon that is as old as the Jedi Order itself, in fact it goes further back to its predecessor. So what a force imbued blade is, is typically uh, it's made out of a high carbon metal, uh, usually dubbed steel, and it's tempered, it's basically forged with a hammer and forged by channeling the force into it. Now what this would do is it would alter the molecular structure of the blade and the metal as it is reinforced. This would essentially also give it a sharper edge as well, so not only is it a tougher metal then, it becomes a sharper blade. Once the Jedi in question, or Jedi, who was the original order before the Jedi Order, had finished forging the blade, they would inlay an energy crystal into the blade, or in current canon, kyber crystals, and then they would marry the blade, crystal and themselves together. They they basically accomplished this by submerging themselves deep within the force and meditating on the blade and crystal until, until both of them become one. Once this is done, the weapon is then fully imbued permanently with the force. 
Now this means that they can use this blade to parry and deflect lightsabers and it will cut with a similar cutting power. The advantage over a lightsaber is as well is that as it is a blade with weight it will also have momentum and a counterbalance. Now these weapons are much harder to build than a lightsaber due to any imperfections in the blade during the process can result in it exploding. Which is probably a bit hazardous to your health when you think about it if you've got it sitting on your lap while you're trying to channel force energy into it. This blade mostly fell out of use when the force saber was first invented which was the first step towards creating the lightsabers. Following this it was the proto saber which was essentially a blade with a massive power pack attached to it. Not really handy in a combat situation. And then finally you've got your standardised lightsaber template. Okay, next we're going to move on to energy shields. Now, lightsabers it has been shown in various sources including episode 1 that lightsabers cannot pass through energy shields. For example, when Maul tried to get to Qui-Gon by whacking his lightsaber into the energy field and then it just dissipated the energy. Now, that is, that, that is a good way of blocking a lightsaber, but the problem is personal handheld or other such energy shields that don't have an external power generation have a limited battery. So if, you, uh, if you're going to use a personal shield against a Jedi wielding a lightsaber, you've got to have a very large battery capacity, otherwise they can outlast you and then just cut your arms off and then you can't reactivate the shield. Sum that up, make sure you're going with lithium batteries, not your cheapy 99p batteries from the local corner shop. Uh, as the bounty hunter Dirge found out the hard way during the Clone Wars. Um, then again, he did have high regenerative properties, so it didn't really matter too much to him. Okay, moving on. Now, this one, next one might seem like a joke, but believe me, this is 100% true. Water is actually one of the best materials to use against a lightsaber. Not because it can block a lightsaber or it can be used proof, but it will heavily hinder a lightsaber passing through water. In fact, um, if you submerge the blade in water completely, there is a chance that it will short out and then you can't use the blade at all. Obi-Wan found that out the hard way in the Phantom Menace comic. That's why he was running away from that droid speeder bike instead of simply igniting his lightsaber. A scene that was missed out of the movie. Okay, we're now going to move on to creatures um, that have been used as armor or such things to resist lightsabers. But the first one we're going to talk about is the Orobalisk, which is a creature that lived on the moon of Duxon and was known to feed off the dark side of the force. Now Darth Bane went there, got attacked by these creatures and they bonded to him. Well, one bonded to him and then using their abilities they would multiply and grow rapidly and envelop him and suffocate him. Not really a lovely way to go. Uh, hmm. Thankfully he was able to use knowledge from Frieda Nad's holocron to make amends to them to prevent them from covering his face, hands and feet. This meant that he could then use this as armour. Now the outer shells of them were highly resistant to lightsaber attacks so this meant he now had lightsaber resistant armour that could be hidden under other clothes. Uh, the main weakness to these creatures is that it leaves the joints exposed so if you have someone who's particularly good at dueling they can target your weaknesses such as the joint underneath the armpit or in between your knees. The problem being is the joint would be so small that it would be very hard to penetrate those areas. One major downside to these creatures is they are susceptible to electric based attacks. Um, for example, if someone was to use a force pike, they would cause massive discontent to the creatures. Not enough to actually kill them. Uh, you'd require something on the side of, say, force lightning in order to kill them. And the bonus of this is when you actually kill one of them, it will secrete a po highly toxic poison into the user's nervous system. Though a notable bonus of this to a dark side user is, is it will actually fuel your power because you will be feeling the pain as you're doing this. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to the Yuuzhan Vong technology, uh, most notably the Valorium Crab armor. Now Valorian Crabs were living creatures that were turned into bioengineered armor by using long shapers. The advantage of this armor was is that in certain variants it could increase your strength 
uh, one of the former War Masters had one of these. But its most beneficial thing is that it had a crystalline property, which meant that it was resistant to blasters, slug throwers, and lightsabers. And okay, it wasn't good enough to resist Starfighter fire, so a Starfighter could easily have power it. A Mandalorian using a pair of Mandalorian crush gauntlets could crush the armor with repeated pressure. And force lightning was something that could be used to break the armor. Now, seeing as Valorian Crab is a living creature, it does mean it is susceptible to things that can affect living creatures. For example, there was a type of pollen on one of the Ephorians' worlds that they were highly allergic to. In fact, in the book, um, when it's discovered, it swells up like a balloon after the warrior is killed. Corrin Hor burns the surrounding area to hide the truth of what had happened. Now, one particularly major weakness in the armour in terms of dueling is that it didn't cover the user's head. You'd have to have a separate art helmet made out of another smaller crab. And the actual gills for the creature were located under the armpits, which meant a particularly skilled duelist could go for the weak point and deal from that way. Now, the armour, I do believe, is also been shaped in a certain way to cause a psychological nature. Simply because it makes you look, if you're wearing the armour and the helmet variant, it will curve up in terms of spikes and make you look like you're giving them a skull smile. Which has a particularly lovely effect on your enemies when you're fighting them. Uh, as a backup as well, the spikes and protrusions on the other parts of the armour could be used as weapons in an emergency situation. Now, to further stress how useful this armour was and how much it became a, a commodity after the Yuzhan War, the Ninja Order actually started using modified versions of the armour to use in lightsaber dueling practice. Uh, apprentices such as Ben Skywalker, when he went to challenge his father to a duel, would wear the armour until his father ordered him to remove it. One does have to wonder if the Ninja Order had anything vaguely like a modern safeguarding policy and to perhaps what the physical appearance of the safeguarding officer was considering how much stress she'd be under given the various violations. But not to worry, uh, Luke didn't actually have a power cell in his lightsaber. Uh, the challenge was for his son to make him ignite his lightsaber, something which he couldn't do. But that'll be covered in another video. Another notable wearer of Valorium Crab armour would be Darth Krait, Dark Lord of the One Sith Order, uh, a character from the Legacy comics, who wore an unmodified Yuuzhan Vong armour that he got back in the Galactic Civil War. Um, he's actually quite an old Sith and he was keeping himself and the armour alive due to using stasis for several years and they're only coming out when they needed to. Swiftly moving on, we're now going to talk about the Amphistaff, which was the uh, primary melee weapon of Yuuzhan Vong warriors. Now the staff itself was also a genetically engineered creature. It was a serpent that could be used as anti-personnel weapons as well as various other things. Now they were fully organic beings with minds of their own so if their user was hurt they could still act in their own way by biting their enemy. Now, they served in three different configurations of spear, quarterstaff or whip, with a poisoned head at one end. Now, these had the same crystalline structure as the Valorium Crab, which meant they were perfect for deflecting lightsaber strikes and also blaster strikes. In fact, in their first few encounters, the staff would coil around the lightsaber blade and then have the head strike at its user. This had a notable psychological effect on both the New Jedi Order and the Republic troops at the time. This is partly responsible for why the Yuuzhan Vong were so effective, the Republic were completely unprepared for something like this. Now, as this creature is living, it can recover from nearly any damage it eventually takes. And so the only real way to destroy these is the removal of the head or repeated blood force trauma. Another application of this weapon as well is it could spit its venom and it would aim deliberately for its target's eyes, thus poisoning them and also blinding them. I don't think there will be anybody on the internet who finds these things to be as cute as cuddly as the various other creatures we have on the internet. Though I'm pretty sure I will be surprised at some point in the future. 
it's the internet. Somebody somewhere will love it. I'm going to move on to one last section, and that's going to be creatures of the dark side. Now, dark side practitioners and Sith alchemists were known to create varying creatures designed to hunt down the Jedi. Now, one key quality of this was that they would make them very resistant to saber attacks. This could be a multiple of ways from having thicker armour to having armour that was very heat resistant. Uh, I'm going to cover a full range of Sith and dark side creatures in its own video. I just, just thought that these might have an honourable mention here. Okay guys, uh, thank you very much for watching. If you like what you heard, feel free to share this around. And remember to like, comment and subscribe. As always, my sources will be listed in the description below. Right, have a good day, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Lost Archives.